Aloha folks and welcome to the Solar Coaster Road to Nola Film Project. In this sector video, we took a look at energy storage and tried to think in the broadest terms possible about what this means. Of course, lithium batteries are the first to come to mind, but what about mechanical and pneumatic, biofuels, or hydrogen for that matter? And PSH, or Pumped Storage Hydro, do these hold promise as well for the renewable energy revolution? We started out with Doug to hear his take on the role that energy storage is playing, the current limitations, and potential for the future. Pumped Storage Hydro is, is the sort of dream for a lot of people because you can just pencil it out to be as big as you want. You know, like instead of a kilowatt hour discussion, you know, you're starting to have, you know, a, a megawatt month discussion. If, I, if I'm on Kauai, I, I, I remember the hurricane experience they had. And so, I, you know, a lithium ion backup for, you know, a day or two is not necessarily a, a useful time period if I'm thinking about hurricanes and extended outages. So, you know, pump storage, that's that's the ideal, is it's a giant time shift. You know, that, like you said, on Kauai, they're having daytime 100% uh, renewable, very common in a summer month. And so it's a giant time shift. Take that surplus output, put it up, you know, into, into water, and then we use gravity to release it. And, you know, because the, the release mechanism is basically gravity and it's kicking into turbulence, you know, nighttime versus daytime. Pump storage hydro is great for nighttime. I mean, there's just, there's no downside to, to running at night. Um, but, you know, people need to recognize that there is, there is a loss in all this process. I mean, the amount of energy it takes to pump that water up high, you know, will never be fully recaptured on the run down. I mean, the, the, yeah. the point of this is all the time shifting. So you, you use your renewables, if it's wind or solar, to send that water up high and, you know, just release on demand. But it really kind of, you know, because there is that inefficiency. It needs to be about the time shift. I would say that the one of the trends I definitely see is, you know, people starting to think, okay, you know, how do we how do we limit the number of times that we have to use the battery as the first line of defense to to some grid quality issues? And I think that's about control mechanism more than you know the cell manufacturing process. So. You know, when you talk about storage, I think part of this is a geology lesson too. I mean, there are places in the world where, you know, there are natural formations that are gonna let you do things, uh, whether it's a, you know, a pumped air or different kinds of things. But, you know, for most places, I think we're all struggling with how do you do a lot of storage and keep the footprint reasonable? You know, it's, it's really tough. And that's where, you know, if you wanna say you have a better solution than lithium ion, you know, we have this energy density discussion because, you know, a, a lithium ion battery, the size of a big trailer, that's a lot of energy. And, and it's very hard to recreate that with other types of batteries or, you know, other types of storage without getting a lot bigger. On the residential front, you have homes all, I mean, and, and of course, Hawaii is leading the charge in many respects. We've got pretty much every system that's going in at the moment. It's maybe a bit of an overstatement got batteries to it if you're putting in a system without batteries it's kind of like well where's what's your battery i mean that's it's you in the past it was what's solar now it's what's the battery all about you know and so we've got guys like end phase the ensemble program we spoke with regu on this series we've got guys like solar edge with their brand new battery with the coco acquisition hank rogers of course with his blue planet uh energy and the lithium iron phosphate in his systems and, and sun power panasonic's evervolt system generate it's always great to sit down with Doug and work out the core issues around a technology. And storage, of course, is the big one. We found out that it's not just chemistry or method, but we need to look closely at the managing of that storage. A question that emerges is what is the function? It might be shouldering or a time shift to later periods in the day, but that time shift is often limited, especially during lithiums. Long duration storage becomes an area of interest, and as a result, PSH, Pump Storage Hydro, offers the island of Kauai a 12-hour time shift, enabling the cooperative to take full avail of its abundant renewable energy sources. We started out with two large um, conventional PV facilities here that were done five or six years ago. We soon realized that for a small island grid, we needed to have storage, so we did a PV project about the same size as the conventional ones we did and we partnered with Tesla and Tesla came in and brought four hours of storage for all of the output of the project. At that time it was the first uh, 
utility scale uh, PV and storage project done anywhere. And Tesla is great to work with. We figured it out, got it online and worked very well for us, able to store most of the output of the facility for four hours. And we went on and did some more. We signed an agreement with AES for a project that was almost twice the size of the Tesla one. Tesla was 13 megawatts with four hours of storage. The AES the Y project was 20 megawatts with five hours of storage. That one came online a couple years ago. Again, great company, great partner, been working extremely well. And with them, we doubled down and did one more uh, PV and storage project that is out at the Pacific Missile Range on the west side of our island. It's about the size of the Tesla one. It's 14 megawatts with five hours of storage. That project's innovative because it allows the military base to island itself. If there's a grid situation where the electrical service doesn't go out there, the base can actually operate totally off the PV and battery that's out there on our west side. So all of that PV going on, we also have a biomass plant here that's about 10% of the island and we get about 10 or 11% from legacy hydro plants. So all of that adds up to almost 70% renewable. Last year we hit 67% for our grid and really more important to the next topic, pump storage hydro, we're routinely hitting 100% renewable during the daytime when the sun is shining. So our, our grid is pretty much filled up with what we can take of conventional PV without it being stored. And it's really for an extended period of time that we're 100% for four or five hours a day often. So that's really in the sweet spot of when you can put PV in with a, with a battery, with a conventional battery of four to five hour duration. So we look at our island, how do we, how do we go further? How do we move from 65, 70% up closer to 100% and we need long duration storage. And we're fortunate enough here that on our west side, we have the topography that's perfect from some legacy uh, plantation infrastructure where we have three reservoirs at different uh, elevations ranging from 5,000, almost 5,000 feet downward to the uh, Manah Plains that is at 30 feet. And most importantly, the lower two plantations, there's several thousand feet between them and connecting a pipe between the two reservoirs, we were able to uh, do pump storage. It will be tied in and powered by a large PV system on the Manah Plains on the far west side. It'll be a 35 megawatt PV field. That'll run massive pumps that'll pump the water uphill during the day when our grid is otherwise filled and we can't take that solar to, to our grid. Pump the water uphill, it'll store it. And at nighttime, or if it's a cloudy day, we'll be able to release the water and uh, harvest the energy and, and make more uh, renewable sourced energy at nighttime from the sun. So the important part about this project is that routinely can hold up to 12 hours of, of uh, output from solar. So the entire output of a system over the, when the sun is shining can now be stored, which is absolutely essential for us when our, when our grid is filled up otherwise. So it's a unique project. It's to use the PV and tie it into pump storage. We're not aware of any place else that that's, that's being done. It's really because of our unique situation here with such high penetration of renewables. Um, we're limited on what renewables we can use on Kauai. We, we really can't do wind. Uh, we don't have a geothermal resource here and biomass is kind of out of the market on, on pricing for any more as uh, PV pricing has declined so much. So pump storage hydro was, was the next frontier. Uh, if that project uh, reaches fruition, uh, by the end of 2025, it would be about 25% of Kauai's energy from that one project, and it would get us up to pushing 85% renewable. So. After digging into the many benefits of PSH and the distinct role it is playing to inch Kauai to 100% renewable energy future, we wanted to look at another area entirely, biodiesel. And Bob King on Maui has been at it for decades. What are some of the benefits Biodiesel really, uh, you know, I, I think of it as the gold standard of renewable energy because it's it's so diverse, so versatile, uh, diverse, um, 
and you know you can store it easily in in regular tanks use it when you want to a lot of people say well you know let's let's get rid of diesels let's get rid of you know all carbon all internal combustion and just go with electric but but we got to follow the science here if we're gonna if we're gonna do this right let's let's follow the science and the science is that um, uh, CARB just came out with a, a good study in the last um, month, uh, California Air Resource Board, saying that uh, biodiesel is um, three times better life cycle greenhouse gas emissions compared to electric. And, you know, like, wow, well, how could that be? But, you know, there's a lot of resources that go into making batteries and electric vehicles and the electricity that charges electric vehicles. So in Hawaii, the number is probably closer to five. It might be more, five times better greenhouse gas, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions running biodiesel in a truck or car. So, you know, let's, let's, not, let's not bypass the best and, and uh, to go with what's, what, what seems on the surface to be clean, which is electricity. Uh, we do need it all. We're going to need everything. The, the, the bad guys is fossil fuel. Let's get rid of the fossil fuel, but let's make sure that we keep all of all the options that we can. Um, right now, we, you know, Pacific Biodiesel is making a lot of biodiesel in Hawaii, over five and a half million gallons a year. And last year, we sold a lot of it to the utility. We made um, 80,000 megawatt hours of electricity with biodiesel last year in Hawaii, or the utilities made it, we supplied the fuel. So that's a lot of electricity and it's, um, or base load. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a really nice fuel. Um, that said, we're, we're, that's about all we can make with what we have in Hawaii. So we've got to get to the next level, which is growing more feedstock. And and I will say that, you know, well, well um, photovoltaic panels are a converter of solar energy to electricity. Uh, we use the biological path, which is those the sunflowers that you were, you were looking at the other <laughs> last year. Um, spectacular converters of solar energy. The last little bit's the hard one because, um, you know, it, it's not a, it's, it's a difficult value proposition to have, you know, um, huge batteries that's gonna make it through those, that cloudy windless week uh, and still keep the lights on. Um, so, so you need those bat those batteries. You're going to need once a year or twice a year. It, it it doesn't make any sense to invest the phenomenal amount of money into that. Biodiesel is a perfect fit. Hmm. So, so biodiesel will last for several years without degrading. Uh, so you can you can store it up and use it whenever you want uh, when you need it. The goal uh, is to use it as little as possible because. You know, while it's there, it's it's also expensive, and you got to grow it. And uh, so, so as what we don't want to do is um, say the island of Maui that uses 50 million gallons of diesel fuel a year for electricity. You know, trying to just wholesale replace that with biodiesel is that's not a good proposition. But that last 10 or 20 percent, that's that's the spot. That's the sweet spot. I like the potential of agriculture in jobs and new product lines alongside of producing a clean fuel. And with the advancements being made in low carbon emitting farm machinery, uh, I felt this area could play a key role for rural communities like ours. And given that they're used in backup generators for Maui Brewing Company, for example, it's clearly a useful time shift. I had one other area of storage that I wanted to tap into that was a little bit unconventional. That's thermal. So we got on the phone with Mike and Trieri of Sundrum to talk thermal storage of energy. Uh, combine the photovoltaic panel to also gather thermal energy off it. So you get electricity plus thermal energy at the same time. Uh, we own the world record. We can get over 90% of the sun's energy, you know, uh, between electric and thermal. 
And in terms of thermal storage, one of the things with electric is, and we're talking a lot about electric batteries now, right? But most electric is grid tied. So you have a way that if you're not using the electricity, if you're connected with the grid, you can put it on the grid and someone else can use it down the road. With thermal, that's not the case. Uh, basically, you know, I usually describe within a thousand feet or 2000 feet where you're creating the thermal energy, you need to use it. Uh, or else you have uh, very high costs or high thermal losses that are um, problems in the design. So uh, with the thermal component coming off the PVT, uh, we basically use three types of storage. Uh, the most common is water. Right? You know, the uh, domestic hot water systems have water storage. They're, they're fantastic batteries. They, they can hold uh, kilowatts of energy daily uh, for later use periods. Over at the brewery, we have uh, 6,000 gallons of uh, thermal storage capability. Uh, the other type of thermal storage that we'll use is um, phase change material. So uh, there's phase change material out there where um, I'll, the example I use is we have a home in San Jose where we're providing 100% of the uh, thermal needs, both heating and cooling. And in our solution, we provide our best cooling at night. So we have some phase change material in the house that basically uh, we charge at 75 degrees or discharge in this case at 75 degrees. And during the day where it's getting real hot at uh, 90, 100 plus degrees, that phase change material is absorbing the energy and keeping the house comfortable. Um, and we have a therm of phase change material in that house. And basically a therm is a thousand square feet of therm. And then the other that we'll use is if we're doing long-term storage, um, where we're storing heat in the summer for use later in the winter, we have a couple projects that we've done. Uh, many of them on Long Island or there's one up on the ski mountains of Vermont. Uh, but a large scale is what we're uh, working to do in Albany, New York. So a nice cold climate, uh, gets plenty of sun in the summer, and we will uh, basically take some of the excess energy that we have and we'll put it in the bore field. Uh, so basically we're using geothermal storage in those cases. Uh, so in terms of the most common types of storage we use, uh, the most common is water. Uh, second after that is um, actually is probably the bore field, uh, geothermal type storage. And then third, uh, when it's uh, smaller quantities or captive, uh, we'll use phase change. So there you have it. That's Mike and Trieri with Sundrum talking thermal energy storage. Who would have thought that water, phase change, and geotherm were the core methodologies to make that happen? And the geotherm was already a long duration storage mechanism, seasonally for that matter. Well, we wanted to finally jump to the area of electrochemical storage that are batteries as we typically think of them. So, of course, the Sonin Ecolinks technology is something that's one of the granddads of the on-grid battery space out of Vippeltried, Bavaria. And, of course, Jay and I went there uh, about two years ago to meet up with the team and learn all about their product line. But there is an organization here in Dallas Fork in developing the operating system of energy. It's called Adapt Energy. Pantech Design, the creators of Adapt Energy, that is. They have recently announced a integration with Crestron. Now, Crestron is a very sophisticated smart home control system, but been around for quite a while. And they're typically found in high-end residences across the country. What kind of residences, you might ask? How about the White House, for one? But uh, we, uh, we, we started with the inception of sort of more of the software side of things because we could, working with this Sonin intelligent battery. One of the beautiful things about Sonin and the battery technology is that they've got a lot of these things built in that manage the battery under different conditions and circumstances. Um, but what we did with them early on was just augment what they do with software. Well, one of the things that we realized uh, through that process was that load control uh, is a necessary thing as well. And so that's where Adapt Energy really became not only a software solution, but a hardware solution too. And then from there, 
we've expanded into sort of what you started to define as the energy OS, right? The energy operating system of a home, because we believe that, that that's the true future. It's intelligence that is, is gonna get us where we wanna go and sort of start hitting on all the different points to make a lot of the different pieces of hardware work really well together. We'll start with Crestron. Um, one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't know about Adapt Energy is that it's actually based on a Crestron platform. Um, we chose a Crestron platform because their processors are uh, extremely secure. In fact, the very processor that we use in Adapt Energy is used in places like the Pentagon and the White House and sort of other government installations. And the reason why it, it can go in there is because it can run on an enterprise grade uh, network with full TLS 1.2 capability and able to communicate with a domain controller or be controlled, if you will, by a domain controller and, and the like. So um, this, this partnership that we, we've created with Crestron happened a while ago, but this new thing that we've just done is an expansion really of the partnership between Adapt Energy and now Crestron Home. And Crestron Home is their flagship residential software. And so now Adapt Energy and Crestron Home play really, really nice together. You can literally set up an Adapt Energy system now within Crestron Home in a matter of minutes, which is super. a couple of things that we're playing with right now that are really exciting and fun is a state of charge load shed. Um, seems like a pretty simple and easy concept. It's actually not. Uh, the algorithms involved are pretty, pretty crazy. But in a simple form, think about a home battery and a home battery that's discharging, all right? So powering the home and the home being able to recognize that the state of charge of the battery is now below a, an X threshold. And because of that, we have to turn off X, Y, and Z loads. But we need to choose the correct load, both by priority and also by current use. So that's where you start getting into taking real-time information by Conditionals. the and having a lot of conditional logic to define what's going to happen that's and have great. all this happen automatically. Yeah. And and here's here's the beauty of this. And so we're, we're talking a lot about storage here. Well, one of the difficulties, if you will, of storage, is, in my opinion anyway, is the lack of ability to calculate loss properly in an inverter. Okay, anytime you make an inversion of, of some kind of power, AC to DC, DC to AC, you have loss, right? Well, what if the intelligence of the energy operating system could sort of make up for that loss and still maintain the lifestyle and, and, and the use of the battery? What a beautiful concept, right? And so that's another thing that we're working on is, is literally looking at, so my Sonnen battery has, uh, you know, basically a beautiful inverter, but it, it in order for me to use that battery and take sunlight and store it and then use it later, I actually, I have three conversions there, right? I got, I got to go DC to AC from the solar, get it to the house. Then I got to go AC to DC to get it to the battery. Then I got to go DC back to AC to get it back into the house. And that's three conversions. So there's going to be loss, right? But there's certain times when loss is okay. And that's when you have excess. Why do you have excess? You have excess because you created it. So when considering the points about energy storage, it can be a time shift. It can provide safety and energy security. In other realms, it might be a tool that helps an isolated island community hit a 100% renewable energy mandate. The chemistries are on the march for greater and greater power and efficiency. And different use cases are there, of course, from EVs to aviation and everything else in between. It's been called the key necessary to unlock the potential of intermittent renewables, and it's clear that it comes in many, many forms. We look forward to the chance to get close to pneumatics and mechanical storage in the future and learn more about their role and application. For now, I'll be happy to get the smallest battery I can for my home here in Maui.